Hello, folks. This is Pastor Mike Hoggard coming to you from Watchman Studios with another Watchman video broadcast, Matthew chapter 24. We're going to finish. Uh, yes, we will actually finish something. Uh, we're going to finish the the teaching on the gathering, and I've got some really interesting things to share with you on this. Um, and it's something that I've shared years ago. It goes back years ago. Um, but, you, you know, you always study more. You always learn more. Not just from, uh, you know, things you read about certain symbols or whatever, uh, but about things, you know, in the scriptures. Read a verse dozens and dozens and dozens of times and you're still, if God blesses you, you're going to find something new just about every time you read it. You're going to find a new application or you're going to find something actually in the verse that you didn't think was in the verse or didn't know it was there or don't remember it. And that's the case today. Let's start out with our verses of scriptures. Uh, actually, the really two parts of scripture, Matthew 24 and what I believe is its companion 2 Thessalonians 2, Matthew 24, verse 29, Immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened, and the moon shall not give her light, and the stars shall fall from heaven, and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken, and then shall appear. Oh, I want to see that. And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. And then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. You know, I just I, I watched uh, a few days ago a movie, I don't know how many years it's been out, not too many years, a uh, relatively new movie called The Darkest Hour, I believe. It's with Gary Oldman, and Gary Oldman plays Winston Churchill in this at uh, the, the time that he is asked by King George to become the Prime Minister of England. And, of course, you know, their government, a little different from ours. Uh, but anyway... Uh, he's asked by King George to become prime minister, and he is trying, Churchill is trying to gain support for not capitulating to Hitler, for not negotiating, for not saying, hey, okay, we, 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 don't, we don't want you to bomb us. You know, we want our children to be, when people give up, when people give up their liberty, their country, for safety, they deserve neither. That's a statement from one of our founding fathers. I happen to agree with it, especially in the, in the area of Christianity. When you give up your country, which is heaven, and your liberty in Jesus Christ, which is, was bought by his blood, when you give that up for safety, peace and safety, you deserve neither. But anyway, um, there is this scene where King George goes to number 10 Downing Street and he goes to, I guess, to a basement room and Churchill's down there and he's, he's about half drunk and his shirt's untucked and his hair's all messed up. You know, he's just, he doesn't know what to do anymore. And I don't know how historic this is, but King George goes and he says, let me give you some advice. Go Go to the people. Find out what they want. So Churchill, uh, on his way, I guess, to somewhere in his private car, stops and gets out and goes down into the London Underground, which is their subway system. And he ends up walking into um, a train, a subway train. And people are just going... You know, they know who Winston Churchill is. I mean, they've seen him. They know who he is. And they're just like in awe that the Prime Minister of England is sitting here on the underground with common people. I mean, this man is a lord of England. 
and he's sitting there among common people. And then he starts talking to them, finding out their names and who they are and what they do for a living and so on and so on. And their eyes are just lit up like this. And I'm saying all this because then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. And then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. I'm going to be like those people on that tra- far far better than those people on that train with Churchill. I'm just going to be going, it's Jesus Christ. My Lord, if there's actually time to say that in the moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump, okay? People, keep going. We're going to see Jesus one day. Keep going. Don't give up. Don't quit. Don't stop. Yeah, I know the devil's beaten on you. He's beaten on me before. Terribly. But I'm telling you, don't quit. The rewards are going to be worth the pain, the trial, the tribulation, the suffering. I guarantee you they will be. Guarantee you they will be. Now, uh, the next verse, 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 1. Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, and here it is, by our gathering together unto him. Let me stop right here for a minute. I don't know if I've made this point. Yeah, I I know I have. But remember what Paul said. He said the whole body is fitly framed together, connected. When we're talking about the body of Christ. You know, my foot bone is connected to my ankle bone. And my ankle bone is connected to my leg bone. My leg bone is connected to my knee bone. But if I were to shorten that, I could tell you that my little toe is connected to my head bone directly through the body. And there is no part of my body that does not receive nourishment, does not receive instructions, does not receive uh, ability and strength from the head. No part of my body is left out being connected one to another. So though we be apart right now, Christians all over the world, one of these days, he's going to gather us all together. Now think of those dry bones in the wilderness that Ezekiel saw. Those dry bones were scattered all over the place. And yet all God did was shake. That you be not soon shaken in mind. All God did was shake the earth and the right bones connected to the right places. And then sinew, which is uh, tendons and things like that. Muscles, tendons, joining muscle to muscle, joining bone to muscle, bone to bone, things like that. All of a sudden, now you have a body, but they have no breath. They're not breathing. Then he preaches again the second time. That's the new covenant. It says, come four winds. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. Breathe life into uh, these, these bones. And all of a sudden it does, and they rise up the great army of God. So this is what Christ is coming to do. He's coming to gather together his elect. And Paul is referencing that gathering. By our gathering together unto him, that you be not soon shaken in mind, or be troubled neither by spirit, nor by word, nor by letter as from us, as that the day of Christ is at hand. Let no man deceive you by any means. I've been preaching that for years. Let no man deceive you. And I'm, I love you. I love you enough to say these things to you in love. I'm not wanting to, I'm not wanting to get into to a fight, an argument, a debate. You can call me names, you already have. But I'm here to tell you 
that the internet will deceive you. It will. And I, here I am saying this, and I am starting research now on something that I'm not 100% sure that it ever happened. And the only, well, let me back up. A partial source of my information comes from the internet, the rest of it from scriptures. And I, and I will say at the beginning of that, when I do whatever, whenever I do that video, I will, I will disclaim at the beginning, everything that you hear coming out of my mouth that comes directly from the scriptures is true. Everything that you hear coming out of my mouth that did not come from scriptures may or may not be true. But it matches what's in scripture. Or I wouldn't do it. Anyway, um, verse 3, Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. So, in Matthew 24, his purpose of appearing in the clouds is to gather together his elect from the Matthew, Mark, Luke, John winds, four winds from one end of heaven to the other. Second Thessalonians 2 references that gathering and says, hold on a second, he's not going to gather you yet. There has to be a falling away first. Because, and at the end of this presentation, We'll go back to the story of the wheat and the tares. And that's what we'll see. Okay? Is the difference between the two and how they are gathered together and who gets gathered first. All right? Now, what we're doing is we're going through the scriptures and we're looking for places where the people were gathered together because that is a typological prophecy. In other words, here we have the doctrine, Matthew 24, 2 Thessalonians 2, 1 Thessalonians 4, 5, you know, other places in the scripture that reference, 1 Corinthians 15, that reference the translation, the rapture, the, the first resurrection, whatever you want to call it, okay? You want to call it herald, okay? Call it herald, doesn't matter. Um, but anyway, we're looking at gathering because there's going to be two of them. One is the gathering of the saints by Christ himself and his angels, which could very well be chariots. Okay, chariots, all of us, just think of all of us riding chariots to meet Jesus, to be one, to be one with him, to be his literal and true body, him being the head. But there's another gathering in scriptures, a gathering of lost humanity. And the gathering of lost humanity has as its purpose uh, to put everybody under one umbrella religion, including the most ardent, bullheaded, stubborn, hard-hearted atheist that there is. No, I'm not a science guy. He's going to believe in these gods. Guarantee you. I guarantee you. That bow tie is going to pop off one of these days. When he sees these gods, he's going, to, he's going to worship them. Okay? So that's number one. And, and it, won't be the, it won't be the Pope. Now, the Pope is part of this. Okay? But right now, as far as I'm concerned, so is the uh, Archbishop of Canterbury. So is uh, Rick Warren. So is Bill Hybels, so is Kenneth Copeland, so is, so is, so is. 
I mean, Babylon is not just one particular person, although people try to convince me of that. It's not just one particular person or organization. It's all of them. Uh, let's go this way in the scriptures. Let's go to the right a little bit. In Ephesians 2, yeah, you know what I'm going to read. Wherein in time past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. They're all in on it. Of course they are. Because they have a spirit of disobedience in them, which is the prince of the power of the air that is, that is guiding and leading everybody to that one world religion, uh, an umbrella of monetary system, possibly Bitcoin related because it's a financial, Bitcoin doesn't actually exist. There are no coins you carry in your pocket. There's no bills you pull out of your wallet. There's no I don't understand Bitcoin. I don't understand how you mine coins with graphic processor units. I, I don't understand that. Okay, but I know it's an encryption thing. And I know it's tailored and keyed directly to a, a particular person. And it's basically impossible to steal but I don't understand it. Okay, maybe I need to do my homework. But anyway, one global monetary system so that no man might buy or sell, save he that had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. Um, gathering people, gathering people together under, to live in, under an electronic umbrella or a electronic network of a communist or communitarian system. Whereas if you try every communist in every generation or every tyrant or every dictator in every generation, there's always been the people that they could not control. Always been the people that they could not control. Well, well, I'll kill you. Live free or die, Jack. It's always been those people. But once the neural net is knitted into the minds of men, or it's great, 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 great grandson, Whatever it looks like, whatever form it takes, connected to an artificial intelligence system, that's about the best that I can see so far, then everybody's going to be common. Everybody's going to be the same. Everybody's going to be controllable. In other words, there will be no dissent. Everybody will be gathered together under the rule and reign of the Antichrist. And it'll be absolute power, absolute power with no dissension whatsoever. That's what I believe their gathering is all about. Let me illustrate it this way. And I originally took these verses out of the presentation, but I did some more research and I thought, no, they need to be in there. It's a biblical illustration of a common symbol that can be found in thousands of places or literally mil possibly millions of places. Let me show you. Numbers chapter 15, verse 32. And while the children of Israel were in the wilderness, they found a man that gathered. There's the word there. Now, let me, let me again, let me stop here. And this is going to be a two-parter, so just bear with me for a minute. The way I'm doing this is the way I do everything that I do. Um, search the scriptures. 
for this one word, gathering, gather, gathered, together, because they're all related. They're all pointing you to this one event. All of these stories are typologies of prophecies that have, that these stories are things that have happened to show you what will happen. There is no new thing under the sun. So anytime I see a place in the scripture where I see the word gather, gathering, gathered, I go, Arr! stop right here. And I look at that. Look at the verses that come before, that come after. I want to see that story. I want to see what happens when they gather this. How does it turn out? What happens? So notice this. They found a man that gathered sticks upon the Sabbath day. <gasps> oh, the vulgarity of it. Now you might say, a uh, big deal. Which is probably what a lot, a lot of lost people would say. Uh, now, I mean, we've got we to gotta have a cook fire. It's freezing in our house, and you're saying it's against the law for me to just gather up a few sticks so we can start a fire? Well, uh, yeah, because you were told in the law, you were told in the law yesterday was the day to gather sticks. You wanted to gather sticks, you could have gathered all you want to. You wanted to gather a great big bundle, go get all you want. Okay, get a cart full of them on Friday, but you can't pick up one on Saturday. You can't do it. But there's a deeper meaning to this. Get ready. They found a man that gathered sticks upon the Sabbath day, <gasps> and they found him, that, uh, and they that found him gathering sticks brought him, see, so they found him in the exact act of doing it, brought him unto Moses and Aaron and unto all the congregation. And they put him in ward, which means a, a warden governs the ward. It's like a little jail hold. Okay, they had a tent set up. They probably had him tied up in there or something like that, or guarded at least until they could render judgment. They didn't want him running off. They put him in ward because it was not declared what should be done to him. And the Lord said unto Moses, The man shall be surely put to death. All the congregation shall stone him with stones without the camp. And again, that's a harsh punishment, which is what the Satanists do and the atheists and everybody that hates the Bible. They take stories like this and say, there's your, there's your God of love right there. Uh, I was shown a, a billboard, obviously put up by Satanists, and it, which it was. It was put up by Satanists, and it says, at least our religion doesn't require the beating of small children. And it was an obvious dig at those of us Bible believers who are given wisdom from the Scriptures, to use the rod of correction on our children in a calm and a safe manner. Okay, but to correct those children to save their soul from hell, absolutely. Listen, God knows more about child psychology than all of the child psychologists put together, including the Satanists. Okay? But you might look at this or others might look at this story and say, Man, that's brutal. Kill the guy because he picked up, you know, because he picked up sticks. Can the, can the kids play marbles on the Sabbath? Because kids, you got to pick up the marbles. Okay. But God, this coming, not, not from Moses and Aaron, this coming from God himself, said he's to be stoned. Now, now stoning, all forms of stoning in the Bible have to do with the fourth kingdom. Read Daniel 2.34. Thou sawest till that a stone was cut out without hands, 
which smote the image upon his feet that were of iron and clay and break them to pieces. The image itself was being stoned by the stone cut without hands, which is the Lord Jesus Christ. So when you go back to stories like um, Achan, who took the wedge of gold and the Babylonish garment and something else, while they were uh, raiding Jericho, when Joshua specifically ordered them not to touch anything they saw in there for whatever reason, Joshua told them, don't pick up their stuff, don't bring it out, don't do anything. Uh-uh. This is not what this is for. God will give a spoil later, but not from here. And what did Achan do? He went against the instructions of Joshua. They, they cast lots. The Holy Spirit guided that until they found Achan. And Achan admitted it, and they stoned him with stones. And that is a relevant picture, a prophetic picture of the fourth kingdom. The man caught in the very act of gathering sticks into a bundle. I said that word for a reason. Into a bundle on the Sabbath day is a prophetic picture type of the fourth kingdom because what is he doing let me show you take a look at this this number one the location of this image is the united states senate where they meet to vote and approve bills it's called a fasces it, it is the, where the word fascism comes from. But what it is, it, here, here's what it represents. Now think about it. If you had a, uh, if you cut a branch about this long and it was about this big around and you tied an ax head onto the end of that branch and you go to swing and that iron axe head and it's just warbling as you swing it you're going to work yourself to death because that one stick is going to absorb the energy of the strike of the iron against a tree or a piece of wood and it's either going to bend it or it's going to break it entirely however take a look at it if you take a lot of small rods, bundle them together with the axe head, can you break it? Well, I could. My dad taught me how to split wood. Okay. For a while, I thought my name was Split Wood. Son. Split wood. But um, I had a problem with, I started out with an axe, splitting wood with an axe for, you know, stove wood, fireplace wood with an axe. I kept breaking the axe handle. So then dad found a, a splitting maul, big iron splitting maul with a wooden handle. That worked better, kept breaking the handle. So my dad took the splitting maul to work and on the big dredge, Corps of Engineers, Miss, Mississippi River dredge boat that he worked on, they had a workshop in there and there was a couple of, uh, um, I don't know, mechanics, guys that could solder or whatever, guys that could, um, you know what I'm trying to say. Anyway, they found, he found a steel bar about this long, put it into the head of that iron maul, welded it in there, and said, see if he breaks this. Okay? Well, it took a couple years. I admit that. But I finally broke the head off that one, too. Okay? I, I can do it. And what it takes is you overshoot the wood 
and the maul head or the axe head is on the far side of the rim of the wood and you actually just bend the iron when you bring it down and it hits that piece, especially if you're splitting oak. <laughs> Good grief, it's like chopping rocks. And it bends it until it just breaks. But anyway, but the idea of this symbol is strength in unity. In other words, one man can't do it. But if we all got together and put our collective strength together, then there's nothing that can stop it. It's, it's politics 101. Everybody's got to be on the same side. Okay? And this is, I mean, this was not invented by the Freemasons. It predates Freemasonry by, you know, like a zillion years, thousands of years. But it does represent strength or force in unity. In fact, the word fasces, you look it up on Wikipedia, and as a symbol, it, it's uh, from the Latin word fasces, meaning bundle. Bundle. So there's strength in numbers. Right? Is that true? Not necessarily. Gideon won with 300. In the days of Jehoshaphat, they won with nobody. Nobody fought. God fought for them, and they all died. They all killed each, each other, every one of them. So is that symbol, is it absolutely necessary that if we have more people, then we will get more done. No, it's not. The effective fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much, the Bible says. It doesn't necessarily. Jesus said, where two or more are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. I like this. I like doing stuff like this. Where two or more are gathered together, gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. Two. Old Testament, New Testament, Jesus, right here in the midst of them. Isn't that beautiful? <sighs> Doodads. Okay? But this is your new world order right here. Satan knows or believes. He knows this part. He knows he can't defeat God by himself. He believes then that he can defeat God if he can get everybody else on his side, he can defeat God. So that's what he's doing. The gathering with the neural network, and I mean, take a look at the FASI symbol again. You got cords binding it together. Do you see any of those sticks leaving anytime soon? No, once bundled, they're not going anywhere. They are a permanent part of the, of the collective, I'm talking commie, commie talk, ain't I? Collective. It's all of us together. Every, every union hall basically says the same thing. One man can't go in the boss's office and declare a raise, but all of us together walking out the door saying, we're not going to do anything until you give us all a raise. Well, then, then that's different. And that's the meaning behind that symbol. Collectivism, communism, socialism, 
Obama saying, well, I believe we've spread the wealth around everybody. It helps everybody. It doesn't help the guy whose money you took, does it? He's out 10 grand, 20 grand, 30 grand, 40, 50 in taxes that you took out of his, out of his pocket and gave it to somebody who doesn't do anything for a living. Wick, right now, we have companies all over the country screaming, we need help, we need workers right now. We'll pay anything to get you to walk in the door to work for us. But because everybody's sitting on the government dole, why, why work? Perfect communist system. Everybody's the same too, aren't they? Okay. So now, read 2 Kings. Here's the meaning of the axe head. 2 Kings 6. So he went with them, and when they came to Jordan, they cut down wood. But as one was felling a beam, the axe head, show you that picture again, fell into the water. Where does the beast come from? fell into the water, and he cried and said, Alas, Master, for it was borrowed. Uh, Southern Missouri is borrowed. I borrowed that. And the man of God said, Where fell it? And he shewed him the place. And he cut down a stick, cast it in thither, and the iron did swim. In other words, the axe head rose to the top of the water and floated there. Did the backstroke. Okay? So I think that iron kingdom, axe head, is the Antichrist rising up out of the sea. That's what I think. Okay? And I guarantee you, just like my dad, with me cutting wood, hey, he keeps breaking the handles. Huh? Judy, he keeps breaking the handles out of, out of the split mall. I don't I don't know what he's doing out there. That boy, that boy. Dad kept getting stronger, stronger material. Okay. Look at this story. Acts 28, verse 3. When Paul had, look at the language. When Paul had gathered a bundle of sticks. Remember what the word fasces means? Bundle. A bundle. When Paul had gathered a bundle of sticks and laid them on the fire, if I, were to, if I were to just cut through all the other stuff that I have and go right to the last verse in my notes, we would be at the story of the wheat and tares. And when the angels gathered all of the tares together and bound them in bundles, what did they do with them? Threw them in the fire. Read this again. And when Paul had gathered a bundle of sticks and laid them on the fire, there came a viper, a serpent, a snake. Out of the heat, the beast coming out of the pit and fastened on his hand. Serpent biting him. Did Paul end up with the mark of the beast on him? Did Paul end up dying? Did Paul end up getting sick? No. People, please, stop being afraid of what you're hearing and reading from the Internet. Stop. Our Savior will not allow us, His saints, to receive a mark in our right hand or in our forehead. He won't allow us. It's not going to happen. Ever. It didn't happen to Paul. And Paul is the biggest sinner in the whole Bible. He said so. I'm the chief of sinners. 
And when the uh, barbarians saw the venomous beast hang on his hand, they said among themselves, No doubt this man is a murderer, whom, though he hath escaped the sea, yet vengeance suffereth not to live. See, he was on an island. It was Great Britain. Maybe not. And he shook off the beast into the fire and felt no harm. Art thou hurt, dear brother Paul? Nah, it didn't hurt. Nah, it didn't hurt a bit. Left a little scratch. Ain't no big deal. It didn't hurt him, people. And did he know that the, did he know there was a snake in the sticks he was gathering up? No, he didn't know it. Did he get hurt? No. God wouldn't let him. Read your Bible. John 15, 6. If a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a what? Branch. What is a branch? It's a stick. And is withered. And men gather them and cast them into the fire and they are burned. Acts 4.26 The kings of the earth stood up and the rulers, this is a quotation from Psalm 2. The kings of the earth stood up and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his Christ for of a truth against thy holy child Jesus, whom thou hast anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, with the Gentiles and the people of Israel, were gathered together. <laughs> Fourth kingdom. Look, look at it. Look at verse 27. For of a truth against thy holy child Jesus, whom thou hast anointed, both Herod, Pontius Pilate, with the Gentiles, and the people of Israel, were gathered together. See it? Read your Bible. Gives, gives, you, gives you a lot of wisdom. Gives you a lot of honey, sugar in your system, so your eyes are enlightened. And it's also can be used as like a purgative, laxative, you know, to purge out all the old junk you used to believe, you don't believe anymore, right? Some good stuff in this book, people. I wish you knew it. Pray about it. Now, look at 1 Samuel 7. Then the children of Israel did put away Balaam and Ashtaroth and serve the Lord only. You know, let me stop right here. Many of you, many of you who used to be in your old life an idol worshiper, generally through the Vatican system, the Roman Catholic Church, you were an idol worshiper. You were worshiping. Balaam and Ashtaroth. Balaam was, and this is, um, I brought this up in the teaching uh, that I've done on the, the Catholic Mass, uh, explanation of the Eucharist, things like that. It's been about a year or so. But remember, according to the Catholic Church rules, there cannot be a Catholic church unless there is a statue of Joseph here, a statue of Mary here, and then a crucifix in the middle. So you hear people saying, Jesus, Joseph, and Mary. Where do they get that from? The idols that they see in the Catholic church, the three of them. That's pretty interesting. Joseph the father, Mary the mother, Jesus the son. I mean, why else would they put a statue of Joseph in there? I mean, who was he? He's just a, a placeholder in the story of Christ. 
Somebody had to make the marriage look right, so, okay? But that's all that Joseph did. He's no some great God to pray to. And yet, what does everybody do? They pray to him. And so they took Jesus, Joseph, and Mary, and they threw them out. The statues, I mean, the idols of Balaam and Ashtaroth. And they threw them out. They got rid of them. They said, we're not going to do this anymore. And that's what has happened with many of you. Is that you came to the play. You, you know, I've had recent conversations with people. Hey, I grew up in the Catholic, I went to Catholic school. And I hate it, one lady said. I hated it. I hated it. I rebelled against those priests and those nuns. I hated that place. Even then, as a young person, she could see the, the false piety of these priests and nuns. She hated it. Being forced to pray. Now bow your heads. Now face, now look at this idol. Here's, here's your real God. Here, here's Mary holding baby Jesus. That's your real God. They hated it. And they come out of it. God brought them out of it. It's like that. God spoke it and they said, I'm, I'm done with this. Never going back. So verse 5, And Samuel said, Gather all Israel. Oh, I love it. To Mizpah, and I will pray for you unto the Lord. And they gathered together to Mizpah. Now, Samuel's going to do something weird and interesting here. What is it that he does? And drew water and poured it out before the Lord. Why? Well, I, I got a theory. Matthew 24, uh, verse 36. But of that day and hour knoweth no man, know not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. But as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered into the ark and knew not until the flood came and took them all away. So shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Oh, by the way, if you didn't recognize that little tune I was coming it was this is the dawning of the age of aquarius aquarius is the water pourer she pours out water and floods the earth and all the new all the new agers all of them have been, and they've been saying it for years any day now we're going to leave the piscean age of the constellation pisces and the next one over is aquarius Aqua, agua, however you want to say it, okay, water. And you have this image of a lady pouring out water onto the earth, okay, with a big pitcher in her hand. So I'm back in Genesis 7, and I want us to look at something in this Verse 11, in the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, in the 17th day of the month, the same day were all the fountains of the great deep broken up and the windows of heaven were opened. And I've made numerous references to this. The rains came down and the floods came up. That's what happened. So you jump forward to the book of Revelation and you see in Revelation 9, the floods coming up, and that is all of those evil angels coming out of that pit, coming up as a flood to cover the earth. But then you see a third of the angels of heaven getting kicked out of heaven and cast down to the earth. 
That's the second source of water. The windows of heaven were open, and all of a sudden, blah, all this stuff coming down from the heavens. It's the same story, people. It is a foreshadowing. And how long did it take place? 40 days. 40. There's your fourth kingdom right there. You see it now? Okay. And they prevailed and they covered the entire earth. Nothing was, nothing was, when, when you've got water 15 cubits above the highest mountain, now we don't know the height of the highest mountain before the flood. Right now we know the height of Everest, and I don't know what it is, but somebody does, and it's pretty tall. I'm not sure that Everest was Everest then. He might have been you know, a mountain called Frank or something and only been, you know, whatever tall. But the idea is water seeks its own level and once you're above the tallest point, everything is covered. Everything is covered. And this is what the fourth kingdom is going to do. It's not going to leave any, it's not going to leave you and your bunker and your seven years worth of food out. It's going to take over everything, everything. God's going to make sure it does.